Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Jesse Hartiz, and I'm the Deputy Chief of Staff here at OSSI. And today we're going to be recapping our meeting from last week on ESSA accountability, academic achievement, and subgroups. During our time today, um, we'll start with a brief update on some English language proficiency metric research. We'll then dive a little bit into achievement and subgroup data. Um, we'll share out some of the conversations that were part of the discussion last week, and then we'll end by previewing some of the additional upcoming engagement opportunities. At this point, you all are on mute, um, but if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the chat box, and um, throughout the session, we'll be pausing and asking if there are any questions. Great. So first to start with English language proficiency, um, ESSA, the Every Student Succeeds Act, moves Title III into Title I. So historically, there has been accountability for English language proficiency. However, it's, it's sat somewhere different than in the statewide accountability system. Under ESSA, we now have to consider that, that metric as part of our overall state framework. Um, but the way that we do that can be different than what has been done previously. So historically, there was something called annual measurable achievement objectives, and that's what states use to gauge the extent to which students were learning English. Um, but under ESSA, we have an opportunity to look at that metric differently, um, which is both an exciting opportunity, but also it's really uncharted territory for states. Um, because unlike many measures under ESEA waivers that recently happened where there was flexibility to try out new, metri new measures, AMAOs were not subject to the ESEA waiver. So states have been using this same type of metric for a very long time. And so we are interested in thinking through a measure that makes the most sense in DC's context and wanted to use some time this afternoon to share what we found out from our research so far. And just as a point of clarification, it's important to remember that when we talk about the English language proficiency domain that's required in our accountability system, that's distinct from thinking about the English learner sub subgroup within our academic achievement and growth measures, um, where we're thinking about how that particular English learner subgroup performs on PARC or our alternate assessment MSAA. So we're talking about specifically in this case how students are doing on our English language proficiency assessment, which in DC is access for ELs 2.0. So just to share some of what we found um, based on our, additional analysis, our initial analysis. So we wanted to see sort of whether or not the first year that a student is taking access, whether or not they're falling into the same place. Um, and we were pleased to see that the first time students take uh, the access test, there's actually a good amount of distribution across all access levels, meaning that everyone who takes it the first time isn't automatically in the lowest category or in the highest category, that there's really a good spread of where kids are starting. And we thought that was an important question to answer as we think about what could make sense for proficiency or growth measures or targets. I should note that in um, the data that you're seeing right now, kindergarten is included, um, and the kindergarten t data is a little bit different um, than the first through 12th grade data, and so that is just something to keep in mind. The next slice that we wanted to take a look at is you know, how students perform at different starting and um, points of proficiency. And we were wanting to test out here the hypothesis that if students are starting at a lower proficiency level, they are more likely to increase proficiency levels faster. Um, this is something that we've heard from our colleagues nationally that tends to be the case um, and we wanted to better understand how that has played out in DC's historic data. And so we did find that our data follows that trend um, and you'll see here from looking at the far um, right column that 
a student who started an access level one or the lowest level had the largest um, increase as compared with students who initially had a higher access level who were less likely to increase dramatically. And again, this doesn't mean that someone can't um, increase, but just that if we were to think about goal setting between levels, this is something we would want to keep in mind. And then the last piece of context um, that we wanted to take a look at is whether or not what we're seeing in terms of average proficiency level varies by grade level. Um, as we know, students, you know, sort of can come in with any possible um, level of proficiency at any point in time. But based on the last slide that we were just looking at, it would suggest that students who had lower access levels initially would have higher access levels over time. So we wanted to see how that then played out with grade levels. And what we see here is what we thought we might see, but with a little bit of nuance. Um, and so we definitely see um, that there are, there's a good amount of variability, um, but that it's not exactly the same level to level. Th this tells us that you know, we de definitely can think about different grade levels having a range of possible proficiency. And what's interesting is looking at this graph um, next to the, the following graph, which is whether or not students in earlier grades are more likely to gain proficiency at higher rates. And here we see, you know, again, what we would generally expect to see, but with a little bit of nuance. So we see, particularly in grades one through five, that um, students are gaining proficiency at higher rates. We then see a, a drop-off happening in the middle grades and then a spike happening back, back in ninth grades. And you know, we've just begun to think about why um, the data may look this way. Um, it could be for a whole host of reasons, um, including that you know, students who are still in taking access in middle school, you know, maybe people who came in later, excuse me, that many students may have actually tested out before they get to middle school, and then there may be new kids that are coming in who have not been in the program as long when they're starting high school. So this doesn't overlay the number of years that a student has taken an access test, which would be important for us to do a little bit further digging. And the key takeaway that we had from looking at this is that the idea of thinking about different goals or different proficiency gain measures by grade level may be warranted. Um, right now, the way that AMAOs are set up, each year there's an expected gain of 0.6. And as you can see here, 0.6 in grade 3 is very different than 0.6 in grade 6. And so as we think about setting goals for schools and as we think about developing measures that might take those goals into account, we think it will be important um, to consider how the progression looks different at different grade levels and different based on students' starting point, what level they are coming in as. Before I move on to the next section, are there any questions on what we just covered for English language proficiency? I should mention that as part of the conversation on site last week, um, this brought up some inquiries about um, end size. And as we think about end size or how many students a school would need to have um, for this measure to be applicable, we have some options. So under ESSA, um, we can consider end size solely in the context of accountability, or we can have a, a different measure for accountability and reporting. So we'll need to have some sort of end size for both, and it's up to us whether or not those measures are the same or different. Um, currently, DC's end size tends to be 25, and we're interested in thinking about going lower than that number while still protecting student privacy and while still ensuring that there is stability um, year to year in how the system would play out. Um, given that not many of our schools actually have a significant number of students taking the access assessment, 
Um, one of the key pieces for us to do modeling on is seeing what the impact of end size is on individual schools ratings as well as how the overall framework plays out um, because for those schools that don't have sufficient N we'll have to decide whether or not the points allocated for this indicator drop out and the denominator becomes smaller or if those points are reallocated to a different indicator. Um, so it's very possible that you know a lot of the decisions about how we handle this particular indicator are not just based on um, our sort of philosophical belief and what the data shows us on the indicator itself, but how that interacts with the overall framework. And the second piece that I want to bring up as a point of clarification, um, given that it came up as part of the meeting, is that when we think about levels one through five, um, those are not akin to a grade level performance. And generally level one um, is going to be lower and level six is going to be higher. Um, but that when we're thinking about those levels, exactly what content is covered is going to be different based on the grade level assessment because it's going to be aligned to the skills appropriate for that grade level. So with that, I'm going to transition us um, to academic achievement. And just to refresh um, folks' mind from the draft framework that was shared at the end of September when we last spoke about academic achievement, we touched on the following. So we, we touched on the fact that we were considering a few metrics, um, one of them being the percent of students scoring at the four plus level for PARC, which is that meeting or exceeding expectations or being on track for college and career readiness, that level. Um, as well as an additional portion of points to be looking at students scoring at levels three or above, so that meeting, approaching meeting or exceeding expectations level. And for both of those, we would be looking at the related proportion of students who scored at the three or above level on MSAA, or alternate assessment. As you may be aware, our park has five levels versus MSA that only has four levels, so they line up a little bit differently. We were also looking at um, a considered additional metric of the percent reduction in students at levels one and two. We were considering this because of the need to really move the students out of those lower levels to ultimately attain the higher performance levels. And um, we included all of these based on feedback that we've received so far in person and from our measure survey, um, which indicated the most interest in four plus followed closely by three plus and then some additional interest in reduction in levels one and two. Um, we didn't include here DC science um, because there was less interest in that measure in our initial measure survey. And I should note that our measure survey is open through the end of this calendar month. And so if you are still, if you have not yet completed that survey and are interested, you can find the link to participate from our homepage at www.ossi.dc.gov slash ESSA. The last thing was the inclusion of subgroup performance. And so in ESSA, we have to consider the performance of economically disadvantaged students, children with disabilities, English learners, and students from major racial and ethnic groups in some way in how we think about our academic achievement. And so to orient particularly around that subgroup discussion, we wanted to share sort of exactly what our context of subgroups looks like in DC. Because this is really critical to thinking about how we will weigh and address it in our system. So what you see here is that we actually have not very much demographic diversity in our schools. That actually when we're looking at a universe of 174 schools, so this isn't including high schools, we see that the overwhelming majority of our schools only have one racial and ethnic group that would meet an end size of 10. 
And so what that could mean is if we were to think about some sort of measure that gave points for you know, how your black students performed and how your Hispanic students performed and how various groups performed, that there could be difficulty doing that because of the fact that not every school will have all of those groups. Likewise, um, when we look at some of the other category breakdowns, you'll see that three quarters of our schools have fewer than 10 English language students, while almost 90% have that 10 or more special education students. So way more of our schools would have a sufficient end size for special education, um, but not many would have that EL threshold. And I should note that this is EL students based on taking PARC, not based on taking the access assessment that we were talking about earlier. And I should also note that this um, sort of model of, of looking at N of 10 is solely for the purposes of discussion. Um, ASI has not yet determined what our ultimate end size will be. Um, as I was mentioning earlier in this presentation, um, we are considering our options for end size um, and considering going lower than the current 25, but feel that additional modeling is necessary to make that decision. And part of it um, will be important to keep in mind that an end size that we set has to work for everything throughout our system. So we can't use one end size for English language proficiency and a different end size for special education students. We'll have to be consistent throughout the entire system. So as part of our discussion, um, to get into looking at academic achievement and subgroups, we shared um, some slices of the last two years of PARC data for the three indicators that I just spoke about. And so these will be posted on our website and you'll have an opportunity to dig in further. But what you'll see here is we're looking at grades three through eight and we're looking at the distribution of how students performed. Um, the first three slides that I'll walk through are based on ELA and then the next three are based on math. And the reason why we wanted to show these breakouts is to demonstrate the kind of distribution that we're seeing both overall as well as between subgroups um, and between indicators. Because as you know, one of our goals um, with picking indicators is to think about differentiation and to think about how our indicators can move all of our students forward and move those furthest behind forward faster. And so what we see here is that if we look at the percent of students at 4 plus versus the percent of students at 3 plus, um, we see different performance rates for different subgroups. So that's, that's something for us to keep in mind if we're thinking about inclusion of both of these measures um, because we're not seeing the same thing, so that is helpful, um, and because it might give us more information about how a school is serving both all students and students um, in particular subgroups. We also looked at um, the percent of at levels one and two. And as part of our discussion, we heard some feedback on how this measure may not be optimal. Um, the group that was in person described that it would be important for us to build a system that not only makes sense now, but make sense when we move in the future. And that if our goal is to have all students scoring at that college and career ready level, we're better suited sort of orienting around that goal. And that a better way to think about reduction of students at level one and or at levels one and two is to focus on our measure around growth. And that the measure around growth would take into account how a school was moving students from those lower levels. So that's the feedback um, that was raised on the review of this data. Um, and you'll see that there are similar snapshots for math at 4+, plus, 3+, plus, and at levels 1 and 2. 
So a couple of the takeaways um, that we heard from the small group discussions around these graphs were that including levels three and above and four and above uh, reward schools for their hard work um, and that it's because it's more difficult to move students from level three to level four than from level one to level two. That was one of the pieces of feedback we heard. Um, we also heard about how these graphs brought up the different ways that an accountability system can incentivize behavior for schools and that um, it would be important to have a system that enables schools to focus equally on students who have high educational needs who are at lower levels of PARC um, and as well as those are who whom are at higher levels and that considering how um, to give credit and reward growth from level one to two and so forth is important. Um, but again, that the only way to do that may not be reduction um, in terms of proficiency, but instead looking at growth. And then um, we came back to sort of our earlier slide about the diversity of specific groups of students in DC and that in thinking about the role of specific groups of students in our system, we it will be important to consider diverse as well as non-diverse schools. Um, and that given the impact of weighting on the overall framework, we could um, unintentionally produce consequences that would not be productive. And so again, modeling data um, for these diverse schools will be critically important as we make final decisions in the framework design. Are there any other questions on any of the content that was presented? Okay, um, great. With that, um, I wanted to just give you all a couple of quick reminders in terms of upcoming sessions. Um, if you want to find any of the upcoming sessions, you will want to go to that website I mentioned, www.asi.dc.gov slash ESSA, and click on the Upcoming Engagement Opportunities page. On that page, you'll find a recap of an additional session we had last week on school quality and student success and graduation rates, as well as a session that we're having this Wednesday, beginning at 1030 in person at ASI to give an update on the proposed accountability framework. Also on that main webpage, ASI.dc.gov slash ESSA, the notes um, from this webinar, as well as this recording, will be posted. And you can also find materials from the other ESSA focus group sessions that have been happening over the course of the month. If you have any questions or additional thoughts on the material presented today, feel free to email any questions, updates, or additional feedback to asi.essa at dc.gov. Before I sign off, are there any final questions? Okay, with that, thank you very much for your participation this afternoon. Um, and hope you have a great rest of your day.